Hey everybody, I'm really excited about today's episode. I talked with my new internet friend, Daniel Raz, and we had a really great conversation about building a fitness lifestyle and setting attainable goals. If you set resolutions this year or have a set of goals that you're currently working towards, there's a high probability at least one is connected to health and fitness. Daniel shares the small shifts that can make a big impact on our health and confidence and how he helps his clients make lasting changes. Stay tuned to the end where Daniel challenged my thinking with an application of minimalism I can't say I'm on board with yet. But without any further ado, here's my conversation with Daniel Raz. All right, welcome to the Building Thinkers podcast. Today I'm so excited to be joined by Daniel Raz and we're gonna be talking about all things fitness goals. We're gonna talk about how to start an online business. I think get into a little bit of that. It's a goal that so many people have, losing weight, fitness, and it affects so many parts of our lives. And so I'm so excited that Daniel is joining us today. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot for having me. Okay, and we're gonna jump right in. We'd love to hear your backstory. What got you into being interested about this? I read in your notes that it started at 17. And so take mm -hmm. us back and tell us a little bit about what got you interested in fitness and your own journey. Definitely, so as you can hear from my accent, I'm from Israel. When I was six, my family and I moved to China. I graduated high school there. 18, I decided to go to Canada because my older brothers, one of them was in Australia, the other one was in the US, and I didn't want to be, I felt claustrophobic to be in the same continent, so I'm like, okay, let's try Canada. So I'm in British Columbia, Canada. I went to school for, to university for exercise and nutrition, and even though all my classmates want to be physiotherapists after, and I want to be a physiotherapist as well, going into university, after my second year or so, I decided I want to be a personal trainer. 2020, everything got locked down. I'm like, okay, let's try this online thing. Slowly by slowly, made it work. Ah, that is so amazing. And so, uh, okay, I got to start with what, like the idea of feeling claustrophobic on the same continent. As <laughs> your, uh, so what, what drew you to Canada? Okay, obviously uh, that's a joke, right? But like... Uh, I don't know, I just wanted to be a place where I've never been before. Mm -hmm. And uh, I traveled relatively a lot as a kid, right? So I've been to Australia to visit my brother's graduation. He's older than me. I've been to America. I'm like, let's try this kind of thing. I feel like it's cool. And yeah. I heard it's easier to get a citizenship. So I'm like, all right, let's, <laughs> let's go there. And so talk to us too about, you know, uh, you mentioned being 17 and starting the journey there. Did you have your own fitness journey experience that got you rolling into the changes that you felt. Can you tell us a little bit about that? 100%. So as a kid from ages 6 to 12, I would say, I was probably the most picky eater on the planet. If it wasn't chicken nuggets from McDonald's or hot chocolate, I did not consume it. <laughs> Every time I went to any restaurant, my family had to bring McDonald's, otherwise I wouldn't eat. Right? So I was the most unhealthy kid. I remember at like age of 11, the first time I tried grilled cheese, even like basic things, just because I was so picky with what I was eating. But around the age of 12, I started playing basketball and I wanted to be more competent. So my brother told me I should start eating healthier, which is pretty much any diet except what I did. So I slowly started educating myself, trying new foods and changing my taste buds, right? Because the funny thing is what I used to eat, I don't enjoy it at all right now, right? Because your taste buds can change. So I'm a firm believer in that. So yes, around the age of 12, I started educating myself, trying to eat healthier. I played basketball. I got pretty good. I felt really confident on the basketball court, but I felt that skill didn't translate into everyday life. In social settings, if I went to the grocery store, just in everyday life, I still felt as if I was an insecure kid. But on the basketball court, I did feel really confident. And around the age of 17, I started taking walking out more seriously. And I noticed that I felt more confident, not just in the gym, but everywhere I went. I feel like it mm -hmm. translated into everyday life because I like a basketball, I could carry my body with me everywhere I go. When I fit better into my clothes, when I have more energy on a daily basis, when I feel more focused at all times, everything just started getting better. So I initially was debating between being a personal trainer or a physiotherapist, but I still went to school for physiotherapy. But after my second year of university, I'm like, no, I, I want to be a personal trainer. And then when everything got locked down, I'm like, okay, let's try this online thing. 
and obviously we can talk about this later but faced through a lot of child tribulations made a lot of big risks eventually was able to make it happen yes okay i definitely do want to dig into that but first there was something that is very relevant in my household because we have a an eight-year-old and a five-year-old who may or may not uh also be picky eaters maybe not to the extent that you just described and we try a lot of different things but talk to me about the taste buds do you know the science behind like any what are what is your understanding of how it works to change one's taste buds because I've read different things. I read somewhere that you have to try something 20 times before your taste buds really adjust, but that was a random internet search. And so I don't know the validity <laughs> of the study. So tell us your perception of this. Right, so just like with everything, your environment determines your destiny. The reason why I have a different accent than you know is because my environment was different than where you grew up, right? So the, reason why certain people love certain foods but other people don't like certain foods is all depends what you're close to right and because i was in china i uh after i was a kid when i went in 2004 i was pretty much the only non-chinese person there to the extent that i actually did modeling because they've never seen a white person in their life before right i was the only westerner there so it was either McDonald's or pure hardcore Chinese food. And Chinese food in China is different than American Chinese food. It's not Panda Express. It's very different, right? And as a kid, I just got used to McDonald's, right? I imagine if I went there when, like my brothers didn't have that problem because they went there when they were teenagers, right? Uh, so the only food that I feel like I could consume was fast food to begin with, right? But around the age of puberty, and I would tell you to... Uh, wait until your kids hit that age. Then I just started feeling hungry. I would just want to eat everything. And because I just want to eat everything, I tried new things. And there's so many things that I didn't know I liked until I tried it, even healthy things. So I actually tell this to my clients. The key to losing weight sustainably is to eat more of your favorite foods, not less. And the way you do that is once a month, try a new vegetable, try a new type of fish, try something that you've never tried before that's healthy because you might like it and then you add it to your arsenal of healthy and tasty foods rather than keep subtracting of things that you really like. So it's about adding to your diet things you enjoy rather than subtracting things that you enjoy. Okay, so adding to your diet instead of subtracting, like adding, trying those new things and putting it in, whereas lots of people think of a diet as what do I have to restrict? What do I have to take exactly. out? You're kind of flipping that around and saying, let's think about what you add in and then you have more diversity of the foods that you're choosing. I love it. Let's think about one of the questions that I really like to ask is what do people either overcomplicate when it comes to losing weight and getting fit and sometimes the sentence stem is if only people knew and there might be multiple things here so let's just kind of hit one at a time but if only people knew what is one of the things that you see as those mindset shifts that your clients have that you help them with so you just shared one about adding in instead of subtracting and but what else if only people knew when it comes to getting fit hmm, there's so many different ways i could take this but I'll say if only people knew that if they only focused on the easy wins, then they'll get tangible results and that will motivate them to do the more difficult things. So when people make news resolutions, for example, they're like, okay, I'm going to cut out all my favorite foods, I'm going to the gym seven days a week, I'm like, yo, that's super difficult. That, even for me, like, that's, that's a very harsh thing to do to yourself. That's a very big step. I bet the reason why most people quit is because they don't see tangible results. If you saw results week after week after week after week, you will want to put more effort. You will want to do the more difficult things. So the first thing I tell my clients is let's start with the easy wins. Let's start with things that don't take time, don't take effort, and move the needle in your favor. So for example, I can't snap my fingers and make it that there's 25 or 26 hours a day allowing you to sleep for an extra hour or two. But what I can do is give you a few tips to improve your quality of your sleep. And just with the knowledge, you don't have to take any time, no effort. And when you have higher quality sleep, you feel more focused, you have no more energy. It doesn't matter how busy you are, you can always improve your quality. And your hormones are better, you're able to lose fat and build muscle a lot easier. Another easy win is always have a water bottle within arm's reach at all times. Fantastic. I can see that <laughs> you practice what you preach as well. So, so many times, we think we're hungry, but we're actually dehydrated or we're bored. If you drink water, you won't, n not only will you not be nearly as hungry, you also, 
will be more focused. You won't have headaches. You'll be more energized. You'll be able to not crash in the afternoon because that happens to a lot of people. Everything, so many things will improve if we just drink more water. And that's such an easy win, right? Another example is if you're talking on your phone, you can sit down or you can take a walk. You can move around. You're talking on the phone anyways. Might as well move. As you can see, I'm standing. I have a standing desk. I enjoy that. Not just because of the calorie burn. It actually gives me more energy. I think quicker on my feet, mm-hmm. right? Gives me more energy. Okay, so these these small wins. So I hear in this these tangible results. It kind of reminds me of some of the advice around finances, where it's like the snowball effect of if you start to pay mm-hmm. off certain small debts, it gives you that kind of dopamine effect of oh I did it and now I see I can do more. I hear that same concept of these small wins and then wanting more of that and realizing this kind of goes back to what you were saying about the basketball confidence. It's that confidence that we bring to say I can make a change and then you see the change occur and that the visibility of the change Um, prompts you to keep going. And I love researching goal setting and productivity. I love Charles Duhigg's work on this, The Power of Habit. He has a model where he shows the trigger and the cue and kind of that habit cycle. And so he talks about lots of people want to get up and exercise first thing in the morning. And he talks about putting out your clothes ahead of time and putting on your shoes as the the cue to your brain that putting on my workout shoes is gonna and just whatever you do get up and put on your shoes don't do anything else first if that's part of the habit that you're trying to change what would you say in kind of response to that have you seen that that to play out for your clients or you approach it a different way 100 percent. you know how you see millionaires or billionaires say that if they were broke again they could get back to where they were in a couple of years it's because they have the skill set I bet if you or me suddenly woke up yesterday and we were 400 pounds, obviously it will be extremely difficult, but we'll know for sure that we'll be able to get there. This is because of the type of people that we are, the mindset, the fact that we know for a fact it's possible. And the real key with people that have been stuck for a long time is subconsciously they don't really believe it's possible because they've failed so many times. And the reason they failed so many times is they focus on the things that are extremely difficult. But my suggestion is, again, let's focus on the easy wins so you see the needle move in your favor and you see tangible results that will motivate you to take more action. Yeah, it makes me think about that mindset of growth and learning. And one of the other things that also is from Power of Habit, he talks about the domino effect and a keystone habit. And so for many people, it is fitness, it is health. Mm -hmm. And so when they make that adjustment, let's say they do start activity, more more exercise, and that becomes the keystone habit that starts to shift other things. And they start to, if they want to be drinking less, they start, not water, other uh, uh, (laughs) alcohol, you know, if they want to be doing less of that, then when they start exercising, they may drink less because it makes them feel better to, you know, get up in the morning and go. And they start going to bed earlier, taking care of their body in other ways. And so what do you see as part of that like linking when you are doing those small changes like drinking water, optimizing your sleep? How do you think that helps people get to some of the bigger weight loss goals as they get started? Is it just that is it that domino that you see that where they can do make bigger shifts over time? Or is it the small wins just stack up like compound interest? That's an excellent question, and the answer to that, I would say, is both, right? One of the definitions of confidence is firm trust, and you have firm trust in yourself if you do what you say you're going to do. So every time that you walk out, every time that you eat healthy, every time that you drink water, every time that you get high-quality sleep, every time that you say that you do what you say you're going to do, you keep the promises to yourself, and that will bring a lot of trust within you, allowing you to take more risks and other life, let's say hypothetically, I don't know, start a business. It's not easy to do that if you're like, okay, I went through this transformation. I know what I'm capable of. What else am I capable of in other areas? Because I remember where I started from and I know what I look like now and everybody tells me it's amazing. I'm like, okay, if I can do that, what else can I do that's amazing? I know it's going to take a while, but I have a confidence in myself that even though it might not be easy, I can do this because I've overcome something that's so difficult for a lot of people. Oh, I love this. Okay, I've seen this to be true in my own entrepreneurial journey and in other areas. 
And so I want to hit on and go a little deeper into this idea of the, the trust in yourself. And so there's two different books on this front. I think I will use James Clear. He talks about that we don't, we don't uh, rise to the level of our goals, but we fall to the level of our systems. And then he has a whole section in his book about saying, I am the type of person who exercises in the morning. I am the type of person yeah. who, one of the habits I'm building right now is, I'm the type of person who puts my phone in the drawer from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. to be with my kids. Like, it is a very specific, it is tangible. And by saying, I'm the type of person who, you are owning. And then I think there's a connection here for that trusting yourself. When I do it more times, and I'm the type of person that likes to mark it off. You see all my sticky notes back there. I like to check those things off and look at those habits over time to see until I've established one. And it does, it becomes easier and easier because I say, okay, yes, there's lots of stuff in my phone for work and relationships and things that are there that are calling for me, but it will still be there tomorrow morning. And so putting that in the drawer and each time I've done that, I see this sense of, okay, I can make this adjustment. Now that comes after like many years of researching and digging into productivity and goals and changing things myself. Um, but I, I think what I want to say here is just, I've seen that to be true, both in research and in practice. And, and then maybe I'm wondering, can you give us an example of either a client or for yourself, one of those shifts, one of another small win maybe that led to a larger transformation? 100%. So every time my clients say anything that I feel like is detrimental to them, I'm like, whoa, 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 let's stop right there. The way you speak, the way you think has a direct correlation to how you behave. If, for example, my clients say, I have a slow metabolism, I'm like, okay, that might be true, but why are you focusing on things that you can't control, right? Only focus, only say things about yourself that will benefit you. So... I, yeah, I, again, I always have like 50 examples I can go through. Yes, yes. But bas basically, in terms of mindset, I like to say it in a slightly different way than you just did, which is you don't rise to your, to your aspirations, you fall to your standards. So you already have a certain standard for yourself. You already say, no matter what, I'm going to brush my teeth. No matter what happens, no matter what, I will be a kind person. Even though somebody might be rude to me, I'm not gonna act violent. I have a certain standard to myself. So you can take the same standard to fitness. Even though I might be hungry, that doesn't mean I'm going to eat, right? I have a certain standard to myself that I don't always succumb to my cravings. Obviously, I'm not saying to never eat, right? I mean, not even saying not to never be violent. I'm saying there's a time and a place, right? But most of the times you have to be rational about, is this the best move to make? Is this an emotional decision or is this a rational decision? Right. And can you move that standard? Like if you have that standard for yourself, can you raise the bar? 100%. When you were a kid, you didn't have a standard to brush your teeth every day. It got ingrained into you, right? You didn't always have the standard that you have for yourself. And we always make a change at what we call rock bottom, at the very bottom of the standards, right? So some people's rock bottom is 500 pounds. Other people's rock bottom is 9% body fat right? It's all about the standard. So if you just move the standard up of what's the least I'm able to accept, not what do I want most? What's the least I'm able to accept? What's, what are the things that are must for me? Not what I want, what are a must? What is something I have to do no matter what? So that's why having the easy wins is so important because if you say I must work out for two hours a day, that's a very high standard unless you're the top 0.1% of athletes, you can't really make that promise to yourself. You can only say it and it sounds good, but you can't really make the promise. But my standard is, no matter what, I'll always be hydrated. No matter what, I'll always get high quality sleep. No matter what, if I can move, I will. This, uh, if I can choose between sitting or standing, I'll stand. If I can choose between standing and walking, I'll walk. Even just implementing those standards, don't take that much effort, and obviously don't take any time, and that will get you to top 10% health because nobody yeah. does this. I like this, the part that you added in there of if I can choose this or that, I'll choose this. And so it's making me think about, I, I love sentence stems that help 
you know, just either guide a conversation or guide a mental process to think about. One of the ones that I say is momentum is messy. And when we get into online business stuff, we can talk about that. Momentum mm. is messy, like building this, making mistakes, like it's messy. And so that is one of the messages I say to myself as a recovering perfectionist, uh, that, that just shipping things sometimes is what needs to happen. Just getting the writing out there or the podcast out there or the work out there to a client is what is more important than getting it exactly perfect because then I'll never ship mm -hmm. it. And so that's one thing it's making me think about, but I love this idea of the choice. I will choose because I feel like then your brain is already ready to not just instinctually make a choice that you maybe subconsciously want or whatever, that's maybe not the best choice, but it does kind of retrain your brain to say, when I have the choice to take the stairs or the elevator, I take the stairs. That's just mm -hmm. what I know to do. So when I get to an elevator, I don't go in it. I go up the stairs if that's possible, you know, at that time. I want to hear about one of the things you mentioned in the notes is that your clientele is oftentimes executives, leaders, and so I love work around leadership. I end up in the learning space when it comes to leaders and some of that developmental side and organizational development work. And so I want to hear about this intersection in leadership and what you see for your clients that maybe their sentence stem has been or their soundtrack has been, I'm too busy. I don't know when to work out. What do you say to that client that is maybe an executive or a leader that feels pulled in lots of directions for, for business or for work? Right. And again, with everything, I always start with the easy wins because once they see tangible results, they'll be like, okay, I actually have a lot more time than I expected. Like, okay, I was able to lose 10 pounds in a month without spending any time at all, no walking out, just doing the basic things. What if I do spend 30 minutes a day? What will happen? And my motto, I guess, is I help busy men lose weight without going to the gym. So most of my clients, by most I mean 95%, don't go to the gym ever. They just do body weight at home. And once you know what to do, I like to give the metaphor that Gordon Ramsay will make a better meal with one pan than the average person with five pans. It's not about the equipment you have, it's what equ how, if you know how to use the equipment. So if in your body, and gravity, that's the best equipment there is, there's infinite modifications. Mm -hmm. So as an example, if you take the bench press, right, that's a chest exercise. If you don't have a barbell and a bench and plates, instead you can do push-ups. Let's say that's too difficult. You can do knee push-ups. You can do wall push-ups. If all of those are too easy, you can do diamond push-ups. You can do elevated push-ups. There's infinite ways to make any exercise more difficult or easier, even just with your body weight, if you know what to do. So even if you just have 20 minutes, and listen, if you don't have 20 minutes, don't contact me, you don't have a life. If you can't <laughs> dedicate 20 minutes to your body, then what are you doing, right? So, but if you can dedicate 20 minutes a day, and that's really all it takes. That's a, you don't have to run a marathon or anything crazy, just 20 minutes of doing specific exercises that are tailored to what every person is able to do, then they can get pretty amazing results relatively quickly. That's amazing. Okay, so your motto is you help busy men lose weight without going to the gym. Mm -hmm. And I love this idea of being able to do that, you know, in 20 minutes and not that it has to be some perfect plan or um, the exact right diet, it sounds like, but more realistic to how to make these small shifts that they then get tangible results and then they dive in further. I'd love to transition to talking about, as many people did, it sounds like you made a big transition during the pandemic. So were you doing in-person fitness training prior to the pandemic? And what's interesting is I have trained people both online and in person and my online clients has got so much better results. Now I'm all online because in-person training only focuses on working out, which is 20%. The other 80% is accountability and nutrition. And you can't do that in person anyways, right? You can only do that online. And that's why the results got so much better, which is why I'm all in awesome. online right now. And yes, it's probably April of 2020. That's when I couldn't get out of the house. I'm like, okay, let's figure out how I can, <laughs> let's figure out how I can make myself fit. And that's after a decade of training. So I knew what to do, right? I, I, even though I had no equipment at all, because I wasn't ready for this. I, I just had my room, um, 
in like a, a bit a, a bit of space, not even that much, right? I didn't because I always went to the gym. I didn't have any dumbbells, no bands, nothing, and I got myself to continue being in better shape than I was before. So I'm like, okay, if I can do that, maybe I can help others as well. And I slowly started exploring that route. Okay, so when you when the gym was closed and the weights were no longer available, you made it work without any of the materials you know, any of yep. the equipment, and then you saw how that worked for you and you translated that then to your online business. I'm always interested in talking to entrepreneurs about, do you have a course? Um, is it coaching? Tell us the backbone of how your business developed. Right, so I, just like with fitness, I tried a bunch of things, made a bunch of mistakes, then eventually uh, hired someone, like a personal trainer when I was a kid, who taught me a bunch of things, then I, my my fitness elevated really fast and I started learning on my on myself. So with business, the same things. I tried a bunch of things, bought a, bought a bunch of business courses. Um, they helped me mediocrely. Then I paid for one one mentor, paid a lot of money, way more than I had. We can get into that later if you'd like. Uh, but he helped me elevate my game a lot. Then when I got momentum, I was now I started teaching myself a bit as well and slowly started. I won't say taking off because I'm not going to count myself as super successful yet, but slowly started getting better and better. Yeah. And maybe tell us just one of the lessons learned. You might have to choose here, but what's one of the lessons learned? Let's talk to our listeners that are entrepreneurs that are maybe in online business or things like that. If only people knew, I, I maybe there's a lesson there around the, the hiring of the person that was your mentor, but maybe there's something else. If only people knew when it comes to, let's say, online business? Right, so right now, I only try, I only do one-on-one -one coaching. I don't sell ebooks, courses, or anything, because if you think about it, you're gonna have to sell like thousands or hundreds of ebooks or courses to make like a decent living, right? But if you hire one-on-one -on -one coaching, which is the only way people actually get results, then you'll be able to charge a lot more than that. And you'll be able to actually help a lot more people because mm -hmm. so many times ebooks and courses might have all the right information, but what people are really missing is accountability, mm -hmm. right? And if you don't give them that, then they won't even use the course, they'll just waste their money. So instead of making even an amazing product that costs, doesn't cost that much, but then people basically waste their money because most people won't take action, charge way more for basically the same product, but plus add accountability, right? And then people will actually be commit, committed, they will actually do the work, and <clears throat> that's how you get testimonials. Uh, I've seen that be true for certain industries, for sure. And then I also see some people that do a combination of, with their online course, a live component or a coaching component, yeah. or increasingly, again, depending on the content, not necessarily in fitness, but in other things where it is learning skills or information or practices, putting it into action. I've seen the rise of high quality communities. And I'm not talking about like a Facebook community that was slapped together and then everybody's <laughs> trying to tell, sell you something in there because I've seen that too but just really thoughtfully built communities. One of my new internet friends is Anna Maria Dorgo, and she runs a community called L&D Shakers, and this is in the learning and development space, but it is a community that just, she is nurtured so beautifully that people give hours of their time and resources and energy all for free in this community. Mm -hmm. And it's just built this really nice collection where if somebody has a question, hey, I have a client that is looking for something on psychological safety. Does anybody know anybody? Instantly yeah. people get in there and they say, here's a free resource. Here's somebody that, that you can pay, but that's awesome. You know, things like that. And so I have seen, and I think that that is where some of that accountability in a community can come in where people are encouraging each other on maybe in the fitness world, it's kind of after they hit a certain point. And to your point, like when you worked with the mentor that got you up to a certain point and then you no longer need them because you have the knowledge and skills, maybe it's that, that community comes in for things like fitness after you reach a certain point of you know you've kind of got it going. But I'm kind of thinking out loud, so I don't know if that's true or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything is, you said is definitely super accurate. And even though I still have my own accountability group for fitness, because if you don't have accountability, you're going to lose. Accountability is a game changer, right? Accountability is so important because even me, who I, I guess I would describe myself as disciplined, I don't like sending cold messages, but that's necessary, right? And even though that might seem annoying, and even though I might get some not so nice replies, every once in a while, my 
I get a, uh, somebody say, oh my God, thank you so much for reaching out to you. I'm super excited to do this. You really changed my life. Without this, I don't know where I would be. Right? So sometimes you have to do things that you don't like for a reward that might only happen in six months from now. Yeah. And that's the same yeah. too with fitness and business. What, what has been your approach? What have you learned on the marketing front in getting in front of the right people, getting to the right clients? Do you want to unpack any of your marketing approach? Of course. So initially, I looked, uh, before I paid for anything, I looked at what the most successful people did and tried to emulate that. And I thought that was super clever, right? People that have like Tony Horton, who has like millions of followers on Instagram, the P90X guy, right? Or in Santio, people super successful like that and try to sell like a course, make a course kind of like that. But I'm a nobody. I don't have millions of followers. Why would somebody buy a course for me and not anybody else? That's why the customer's approach, the one-on-one -on -one approach is so much better because anybody can do that, right? Nobody can sell my accountability. It's not something that's replaceable right mm -hmm. so i would suggest that you make a high ticket offer rather than a coaching program if you have hundreds of thousands or millions of followers then do that because you don't have time to allocate to other people but if you're nobody starting from nothing then you should sell a high ticket program and try to help people one one and actually hold them accountable right so for business and actually it's actually out because i never talk about this i never talk about fitness but it is still interesting i still enjoy it Right, so basically you have your uh, leads, the selling process, and then the actual offer, right? And obviously, if you don't, if your offer isn't good, if you're not good as a person, then you might make a lot of money initially, but it's gonna tank, mm -hmm. right? And eventually, which is the point I am right now, is most of my clients are from referrals, because what I do actually works, right? So from from a friend of a friend, right? But initially, you have to market yourself. So basically. I think everybody knows this, but you post content on social media that people find helpful, you give a lot of advice, then people who like or follow you, you message them, be like, hey, are you interested in learning more? If they are, get them on a call, tell them about your program. If they're interested, sell them, get them incredible results, make sure that what you offer is valued way more than what they paid for, they feel really happy about that, they give you a testimonial, they give you a referral, maybe they do both, and that's how you grow. Hmm. Sounds it. simple, right? But like, the, yeah. the, obviously, there are nuances. So that's the basic. Yeah. Okay. You can have a, a business side class in the future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> business well, that, that's a that's a good point I want to touch on. There's some people that teach people how to make money, but they never made a lot of money from themselves. The mentor I bought was a millionaire from online fitness. Then he decided to become a business fitness mentor, right? Yeah. But be very cautious of people that teach you how to make money. And the majority, and all of the money they make is teaching people how to make money. Yes. Right? There's I believe there's nothing, that. there's a lot of that. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with teaching people how to make money. I feel like it's amazing. I wouldn't be what I, I am if nobody did that. But look for people that made their initial money from helping people with services, right? Not through teaching people how to make money. So in entrepreneur life, as you're running your business, there's lots of different priorities and things that come what are some of your favorite tips for your day-to-day -day life as an entrepreneur? Right, and I would say just like fitness, a lot of people want to hit a home run. They want to win the lottery. They want to do this extravagant thing. The truth is, there's a lot of boring work. A lot of things are the same every day. Right, drinking water doesn't sound sexy, but it makes all the difference. Sending messages doesn't sound incredible, but it makes all the difference. That's how you help people. I think... Uh, pretty common saying in the marketing world is conversions happened in conversations. So if you don't talk to people, they would never know, even though somebody might like you, might follow, might like your product, might follow you, might like your post. Sometimes if you don't reach out first, they won't do anything. And a lot of times ugh, reaching out to strangers, what if I get a bad response? might happen obviously there's not so nice people in this world but so many times like, oh my god thank you so much for reaching out i was scared i was thinking about it but because you did yes i'm very interested let's 
do and I love the the connection to I mean it should be common sense but sometimes it's not out there of yep. you know offer something that's worth and beyond worth what you're asking for oh, yeah. and that that builds this sense of reciprocity for yes I want to refer because you're helping people and want we want to help more people and so that is should be at the core of any solid business that is ethical <laughs> is there anything else you want to hit on that you usually like to discuss around fitness or around if only people knew i feel like whether it's fitness whether it's a business whatever it is you want to improve make an investment in the most important and valuable asset that you have which is yourself so instead of buying a gucci bag invest in a fitness mentor invest in a business mentor they will take you to first of all it, I would say if you invest in a fitness mentor, then you look good no matter what bag you have. And I would say if you invest in a fitness mentor, eventually you'll get the point where you can buy as many Gucci bags as you want. The return on investment is so much higher if you invest in yourself. Think about how much money you pay to your rent every single day. Now compare that to how much money that you pay to invest in yourself. Do you value where you live more than the body you live in? Think about that. That's good. <laughs> think, yeah. Think yeah. about that. What do you value more? Because you say that you value your body, but the put the money where your mouth is, right? Like actually take action on that. What do you invest most in yourself? Is it clothes? Is it real estate? Is it crypto? Is it stocks? Do you believe in the market more than you believe in your own ability? Because all fitness mentors say that investing in your own skill is the best investment there is, right? Investing in your own body, in your longevity, is the best skill there is because you take your body everywhere you go. Okay, that that is making me think about one other thing that I want to hit on, and it's this, um, how do I word it? This grind culture, this you got to do more, do more, and so sometimes people will um, ignore their body because they think they need to do more in work, let's say, or, you know, in parenting and all the things that are on our plates. And it's like, go, 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 go until you get sick, until your body says, literally, you have to stop. So what would you tell people on the front end that are maybe disciplined at work, but are, but are putting their body further behind? You know, is there anything else you'd say to that? It's just a smarter investment because in the short run, it might feel like you're being more productive if you neglect sleep, neglect eating healthy, all of that, neglect exercising. But in the long run, you'll be able to be a lot more productive, you'll be able to accomplish a lot more, you'll be able to sustain for a longer period of time. Arguably, or maybe not even arguably, the best podcaster there is, is Joe Rogan. And he takes amazing care of himself. So he's able to do it for a really, 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 really long time. Do like four hour episodes a week for hours on end, he has 2,000 episodes. Obviously, he's going to be number one because he takes care of himself, but you need that amount of energy. You need to be super fit to be able to do that, right? So it's a lie to believe that you'll be able to get more done if you don't take care of yourself. You might get more done in that particular day, but even in the long run, and by long run, even with that week, you'll be able to accomplish more if you do get quality sleep, if you do take care of yourself. Again, if you just focus on things that don't even take time, if you just focus on that, you'll improve. Now, if you are able to invest 20, 30 minutes a day into exercise, then, I mean, your productivity will go through the roof. Imagine if you never crashed in the afternoon. Imagine if you were always on top of it. Imagine if you didn't get tired in the middle of the day. You'll be able to, imagine if you never got sick. Imagine if you were able to live 10 years longer at your prime. You'll be able to accomplish so much more. Daniel, will you tell us, is there any, um, any recommendations? Are there any books that you like to recommend to your clients? Any other podcasts, any courses? And then I want to make sure you tell us where we can find you. 100%. From everything you said, I can tell that you're extremely talented. You read a lot of books. You kept name dropping authors and books and all that. The only book that I've read multiple times is How to Win Friends and Influence People. And I believe that if you just read this book enough times, you'll master life right you don't um you don't need like 500 books you need like five books with them over and over and over again well that's why i hear the most successful people say so i follow that advice 
uh, I found oh, my, my book book shelves are crying really like. right now. My bookshelves are crying. I have <laughs> more than five books. I mean, you'd rather have three close friends than 500 Facebook friends, right? Mm, it's... That, I like me some books, but I, I get it. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it definitely can help, right? I prefer to watch YouTube videos, listen to podcasts, or hire one-on-one coaches, right? I, I want somebody to be like, hey, here's a lot of money, take it. Now tell me exactly, as if I'm a five-year-old who doesn't know anything about anything, tell me exactly what to do. Yes. Why am I failing? Would you mind telling us if there's any of those recommendations, either the person who was the business mentor, if that person is available, and a, any of those YouTube or podcasts, it can be any of those inputs that, that you find helpful. Yeah, to help the most people. I'm just going to say Alex and Mosey because he doesn't talk about a specific niche. He talks about everything and I feel like he's super comp competent at it and he doesn't really sell you anything, right? He only sells people that have like millions of dollars of companies and want to take it to the next level. So for everyone that's below like 3 million, he doesn't sell anything, which is definitely the majority of people, including me, <laughs> right? So, <Me> too. <laughs> right? So I would say listen to him for the most part. And and one of my favorite things that Alex and Moses said that almost nobody repeats is there are no rules. There's no exact method to succeed. One of the downfalls of the formal education, and definitely there's many, but I believe one of the major ones is that we get taught to believe that the more mistakes, the worse will be. But in reality, the more mistakes, the better you will be. The more you fail, the better it is. The more you learn, you will actually only learn by doing right so definitely watch uh, and definitely invest in yourself but also you have to do even with fitness i can give you all the advice but if you don't actually work out you won't know what i'm talking about with business i can give you the best sales training the best marketing tactics if you don't actually post if you don't actually get on calls you won't even know what they're talking about as soon as unless you try it your perception of reality is so off that you have to actually give it a try so you actually know what's going on. Uh, that is wonderful advice. I love the there are no rules. I think as a former rule follower, I'm still yeah. uh, learning that and undoing some of the education that was specific to kind of don't make mistakes, at least uh, on surface level, do it right. Um, or you get kicked out of the AP math class. If you like have a, <laughs> if you have a B minus, this really happened to me. I got kicked out of AP math in high school at an intense college preparatory school because I had like a low B, it was almost a C. And so they kicked me out. I, I used to took AP. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I used to took AP math. But uh, yeah, on that note, in school, if there's a hundred questions, the more questions you get wrong, the more likely you are to fail, right? Because there's a limited number of questions. But in life, it doesn't matter how many fails, how, how many things you get right. So how many failures you have does not matter at all. It's about how many successes you have. And the only real way to get success is to try. And most of the time, you will fail. So again, I'll say that again, just in case people missed it. It's better to have 10,000 failures and 51 successes than 50 successes and 100 failures or 10 failures or one failure. It's not about how many failures, it's about how many successes. Ah, it's good stuff. Good <laughs> stuff. Okay, Daniel, will you tell us where people can find you? Sounds good. So my website is danielrazfit.com. So that's D-A-N-I-E-L-R-A-Z-F-I-T.com. My Twitter is danielraz underscore fit. My Instagram is danielrazfit. I'm most active on both of those platforms. You can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, but I don't use that often, so just check me out on Twitter or Instagram. And I personally prefer Twitter more, it's like the platform more, so I'll definitely be there for a while. I might take a small stop from Instagram just because I want to really double down on what's working most. But still follow me on both, I post different content. Obviously, Twitter is just tweets, Instagram is mostly reels, so I would highly recommend you uh, follow me on both and if you are serious about taking your health and fitness to the next level especially if you are a busy man who wants to lose weight without going to the gym message me and I can get on a call with you to see if and how I can help you awesome Daniel thank you so much this was so fun and um, I look forward to it what's been really fun about the podcast is I have new internet friends in lots of different places so I am looking forward to just seeing your journey continue to grow with your online business and helping more of those men um, 
get fit uh, without going to the gym and uh, just the real life impact that that then has for them to be able to be maybe more present fathers, more present brothers, all sorts of things, more present bosses and employees. And so thank you so much for your time and it was so great to meet you. Thanks so much for listening to the Building Thinkers podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. And if you enjoyed what you heard, please leave a podcast rating and review. That helps more listeners find us in the world of podcasting algorithms. You can find out more about my learning and development strategy services at buildingthinkers.com. And remember, there's no limit to what you can learn.